This weekend we're celebrating Halloween at the Virginia Symphony with a, a concert we're calling Haunted Classics. Classical music that is inspired by sort of Halloween-like things, devils and, and uh, spooky things. And it's been a lot of fun for us to put this together. We're starting with a Halloween classic, uh, Dans Macabre of Saint-Saëns. Um, the devil is often portrayed in literature in, from the Middle Ages on as a fiddler. So in, in this particular piece, Sanson gives a big solo part to the concertmaster, who is the devil striking up his violin. And in, the, in a real stroke of genius, he has the concertmaster tune his E string a half step lower so that it sounds very dissonant and very weird. And you get the, the point right away about, uh, about this kind of devilish dance that's happening. And then the moment that the rooster crows and dawn comes, all the evil spirits disappear and float away. So that's a great way to open it. Um, next up, we have a very unusual piece on any, on any orchestra stage, a percussion concerto by Jennifer Higdon. Jennifer Higdon, one of our country's most famous young composers, um, a real champion for, for new music. She's a fantastic human being as well. And she wrote a, a percussion concerto for Colin Curry, uh, a, a British uh, percussionist who is also absolutely astonishing. Now, when we have percussion involved, of course, our percussion section gets, gets very involved, and Scott Jackson is a member of our percussion section. Uh, what thank do you, think you of Joanna. This piece? Well, I'm excited about doing a percussion concerto. It's a rare treat, and I, I think it's exciting on a couple levels. When I sometimes present to school children about what it's like to be in an orchestra, I always ask them the question, what does a flutist play? I say the flute. And what does a violinist play? They say the violin. And what does a cello play? The cello. And what does a percussionist play? The percussion. <laughs> you know, percussion is somewhat unique in that it's not about an instrument, it's about a role within the orchestra, which to me is to be the rhythm of the orchestra, to be the heartbeat of the orchestra. One of the other beautiful things about being a percussionist is we really only are exciting and interesting and, and musically powerful as part of an ensemble. So when you see a percussion in a concerto, it's a pretty unique thing. I think the other thing, listen, I've never heard this piece live, but I've listened to it several times preparing for rehearsals, is it reminds me about 100 years ago, Schoenberg came up with this idea he called Klangfarbe Melody, the sound color melody. He wrote this piece, I think it was called Summer Morning by the Way. And his idea was, could I write a piece that instead of relying on melody, just relied purely on changes in the sound color and the, and the timbre. And it was really a revolutionary idea. A percussion concerto really is, is the musical evolution of Schoenberg's idea, because now you're getting not only these tremendous colors, more than 20 percussion instruments, all different sounds, so you have sound color, but also rhythmic and style color. You'll hear world music, African music, you'll hear jazz, you'll hear traditional classical rhythms. To me, it's like, looking into a kaleidoscope that's a very slowly turning, but you're looking with your ears and, and your sense of sound. And I think that's a unique thing for a percussion concerto that no other instrument or collection of instruments can do. So I think it's exciting and for the audience, totally different experience. Again, I, I remember someone describing for me listening to a piece of minimalism. It's like sitting in a warm ocean letting it wash over you. But I think listening to this percussion concerto to me is like seeing this kaleidoscope and these shapes change in ways you're not used to and you're not exposed to. Something that's exciting. The other thing for us in the percussion section, they're very challenging percussion yeah, parts. Yeah, yeah. Oftentimes in a traditional concerto, the composer goes out of their way to minimize that instrument within the orchestra so the concerto... Or leave it out. Or leave it out yeah. together. In this case, the opposite. We're playing a lot of things in unison with the solo. It's a lot of really challenging things. So you, it's almost a concerto for percussion solo and percussion ensemble yes. orchestra. And that's, again, I think, really exciting. And, and different than what we normally need to do. It's true. And, and it, it says something about Jan Higdon, I think, that she decided when she's running a percussion concerto, she wasn't going to forget about the great percussionists in the orchestra. So she really wrote, as, as Scott said, very challenging parts for them. And it's interesting to hear the interplay from the percussionists in the back of the stage to Colin in the front of the stage. And Colin is very conscious of what they're doing in the ensemble between them. But what the description that Scott gave of, of percussion is so wonderful because it is all about color. When we talk about color in music, we're talking about color that you can't see, but color you hear. But it is just as vivid and, and multifaceted and varied as color that you see with your eyes. So every percussionist plays, well, scores of instruments. It's amazing when we have a percussion audition how many instruments 
those players have to play, and play perfectly, from triangle to thunder sheet, to mention an odd one, <laughs> and everything in between. I mentioned thunder sheet because we have a piece on the program that calls for tuono, in Italian, thunder sheet, in the Boito, Mephistopheles, prologue in heaven. So what is a thunder sheet? Well, this is, again, this is fairly unusual that we play this instrument. And normally when I've done it, it's been in a contemporary percussion ensemble. I would bet the Boito is one of the first orchestra pieces to ever to include a thunder sheet. It's essentially a very large piece of galvanized steel, a sheet, very thin uh, gauge steel. And when you shake it from the bottom, it has to be suspended. It can't be sitting on the ground. It's hanging from the air. There, you can actually see this wave go through it, and it becomes a sound wave, and it sounds remarkably it sounds nothing like a piece of galvanized steel. Wow. Very effective. The challenge in the Boito is he writes it in a very full, loud section of the piece. So we are putting together now a very large thunder sheet. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure how we'll do it. I have in the past occasionally to really get sound. We kind of cheat and have two people play it. And one gets that wave going. And the other can use a big bass drum or a tam mallet to whack it. To, to give it extra that, sound. To give it a, like an ictus so yeah, that yeah, sound yeah. comes from something. So we may need to do that to get it to come through. Well, see, there's a lot of experimenting, especially in unusual pieces that we have done before, like this Jennifer and Percussion Concerto or the, the uh, uh, Orhito Mephistopheles. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Now, Mephistopheles, of course, the thunder plays a role because the, the scene is set. It's a story of Faust. Faust, the, the uh, man who sells his soul to the devil, spark, creates a deal with the devil, for knowledge and for love, he, he sells his soul. And at the very beginning of the opera, we see Mephistopheles, and he's actually talking to God. Now, this is an unusual thing. Mephistopheles is, is down there in hell, and he's very dramatic. And, and of course, the thunder sheet is part of his kind of domain down there. Uh, and he's, he's uh, betting God, he has a wager with God, that he can get Faust to sell his soul to him. And God, in the voice of the chorus, says, well, let's see. So that sets the scene for the whole opera that's going to follow the story of Faust, which we know that he, he does sell his soul, and at the last minute, he, he repents. But, but um, this is a very dramatic setting. And we have our chorus, or the chorus of angels singing. Um, we have a children's chorus, the Cherubini, the little angels. Uh, Faust, of course, uh, not Faust, but Mephistopheles, played by, by our, our soloist. and. Uh, brass in the balcony, because you can imagine as he's singing up to heaven, heaven is responding with full power down to him. So that will close our program. We also have another wonderful kind of spooky Halloween piece called uh, The Isle of the Dead by Rachmaninoff. This is based upon a painting that Rachmaninoff saw and fell in love with. It's a painting called The Isle of the Dead by uh, Berglund. Uh, Berglund was asked by a young woman, it's a very sad story, a young woman who had just lost her husband, so she's a very young widow, if he would paint her a painting, she could dream on. That's exactly as she said it. And he painted her this remarkable painting of a boat approaching this kind of island. And the island is half, half built up with wonderful uh, columns and, and temples, but also very wild. And in the boat is a coffin. And it's accompanied by a little figure in white. It's a very mysterious painting. We don't know who that figure is or what the coffin is, but this boat is definitely bearing this little soul to this island. And Bergman was so fascinated by this concept, he actually painted the painting five times. He painted five versions of it. And Rachmaninoff was kind of overwhelmed by this. Rachmaninoff lived in his own sort of gloomy world, uh, and he created this, this tone poem, and you can actually feel the waves of the water as this little boat went to this mysterious island. Well, will happen, will, will, will they stay there? Will, is it, will, is it, is it, we don't know, but sitting with this, with whole concept. And again, it brings to the fore a section that people don't always see in the front. And uh, Scott made an interesting comment before saying that with percussion, um, it's, it's um, something that you're not always aware of as in the audience, but when it plays, it's incredibly important. Because those great moments of climax or punctuation or special color or special effect, we're not able to get on any other instrument except that battery percussion that we have back there. Anything to add about your, you and your comments, what you have to do about well, I think the other thing to, to mention is how visual percussion is. I think one of the things that's interesting to me is it's not always just the sound we make, but what we, the way we express that. I know 
years ago when we did the Mahler 6 and I was doing the hammer stroke. And that, in my, my job description, it's as much a percussionist as a piece of theater in my role in that. I think it's the same way in a concerto. To watch a percussionist play a concerto, you're really watching a, a really gifted um, dancer in a way, and the way their body moves and so on. And if you watch us back there, hopefully you'll see some of that and yeah. how we go from instrument to instrument. And that's something I think as I've, as I've played longer in the orchestra, I've appreciated how important that visual role is because we come to music because we love the sound. But one of the reasons people love a live orchestra concert and why it's more than just listening to a CD is all that you see going on. So hopefully as a percussion section, again, we should be pretty unobtrusive most of the time, but when we play, we should really be contributing not only to the sound, but that, that visual That's experience. Right. That's right, when you see that moment when the, the symbols are about to come together, I mean, it's thrilling to anticipate that when you see it. So you're right, I mean, you've got to be there in person. So we want to encourage you, come this weekend, Thursday, Saturday, or Sunday, to, to see Colin Curry and the percussion section as our stars this weekend in this program of Halloween-inspired music.